Who has not heard of my dear friend Sherlock Holmes and the cases he solved so brilliantly? Years have passed since then, but I still remember and now must relate the strange case of Miss Alice Faulkner, a case of which the public were unaware. Alice Faulkner, her most interesting young lady. She was on the continent, alone. Her beloved sister, abandoned by a young man of royal blood who was committed to marry another woman, had died of grief. Miss Faulkner had the letters and trinkets sent to her sister by the scion of a royal family, and she meant to use them to revenge her sister's death. Then she met Jim and Madge Larrabee, alias Chetwood, an unsavory pair of respectable-looking swindlers who, after hearing from Miss Faulkner the facts of her sister's tragic fate and sensing in it the possibility of considerable wealth for themselves, consoled the trusting young woman and lured her to a house in a remote section of London where they held her prisoner in an upstairs room. Her precious letters they kept locked in their desk safe. But Miss Faulkner, a girl of some spirit, one day managed to juggle the lock of the safe. The Larrabees were frantic. The day of the royal wedding was fast approaching, and the groom's family had called in Sherlock Holmes to recover the incriminating packet of letters. This, in turn, aroused the interests of Professor Moriarty, the deadliest of Holmes' enemies, and known in the underworld of London as the Napoleon of crime. The Larrabees were unaware that they were now mere pawns in a far greater and darker struggle. They knew only that they had to possess those letters. To this purpose, they brought in Sid Prince, a notorious safecracker and an old cohort of the Larrabees. Enormous forces were converging to a climax. Ah. Uh, huh? She's taken them out. Oh. What do you mean? My girl. She's got them. She wants to get even, you say? Yes, yes. If she's got them out of the box, ain't it quite likely she sent him to the girl as he wants to marry? No, she hasn't had the chance. She couldn't get them out of this room. We've watched her too closely for that. Wait. Perhaps she's hidden them somewhere here. Here. I'll get her down. She'll tell us where she's put them or strangle for it. Wait here. When I get her in, don't give her time to think. What's he going to do? Only one thing, Sid. We've got to get it out of her, or the whole two years' work is wasted. No! Look here, I don't so much fancy this sort of thing. Don't you worry, we'll attend to it. Now we'll see whether you will or not. Tell her what we want. You needn't tell me. I know well enough. Oh, no, you don't, my dear. It is nothing to do with locks or keys or numbers this time. We want to know what you've done with them. Do you hear? We want to know what you've done with them. You will not know from me. That's enough! You'll tell us what you've done with that package before you leave this room tonight. Not if you kill me. No, it isn't killing that's going to do it. It's something else. Oh. Oh. Tell us what we want to know. Tell us and you'll stop. Out with it! Ah, where are they? I'll give you a turn next time that'll take it out of you. Where is it? Ah. Where is it? Ah. Will you tell? Oh, be careful, Jimmy! Is this any time to be careful? Will you tell? Ah. Will you tell? Ah. Look out! Here, don't go to that door. See who it is. Tall, slim man, long coat, soft hat, smooth face, carries an ebony cane. Sherlock Holmes! We won't answer the bell. Oh, no, that won't do. It'll look crooked at the start. Right. We'll have him in and play innocent. That's your only chance. The girl! Oh, get her away from there, quick. Oh. Up the back stairs. Lock her in a room and stay by the door. She's in poor health and can't see anyone. You understand? Yes, yes. Sit. Get out that window, quick. Keep quiet outside there till he comes into the house. Then you come round to the front. Here. Be ready for him there when he comes out. If he's got the things in spite of us, I'll give you two sharp whistles. If you don't hear it, let him pass. And if I do hear the whistles? Then let him have it.
Go on, answer the bell. Mr. Holmes, I believe? Yes, sir. Whom did you wish to see, Mr. Holmes? Oh, thank you so much. I sent my card by the butler. Oh, very well. Miss Faulkner begs Mr. Holmes to be excused. She's too ill to see anyone this evening. Hand Miss Faulkner this and say I that I... I beg your pardon, Mr. Holmes, but it's quite useless, really. Oh? I'm so sorry to hear it. Yes, Miss Faulkner is, I regret to say, quite an invalid. She's unable to see anyone. Her health is so poor. Did it ever occur to you that she might be confined to the house too much? <laughs> How does that concern you? It doesn't. I merely make the suggestion. That's all. Go on. Take it up. This is really too good. Well, of course he can take up your card or your note or whatever it is. I, I was only trying to save you the trouble. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hardly any trouble at all to send up the card. Do you know, Mr. Holmes, you interest me very much. Ah. Upon my word, yes. We've, we've all heard of your wonderful methods, your marvelous insights, your ingenuity in picking up and following clues, and the astonishing manner in which you gain information from the most trifling details. Now, I dare say, in this brief moment or two, you've discovered any number of things about me. Nothing of consequence, Mr. Chetwood. <laughs> I have scarcely more than asked myself why you rushed off and sent that telegram in such a frightful hurry, why your friend with the white hair left so suddenly by the terrace window, and what there can possibly be about the safe in the lower part of that desk to cause you such painful anxiety. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> very, very good indeed. If all that were only true, I'd be wonderfully impressed. It would be absolutely... Well, excuse me, I trust. Ah. It's from uh, Miss Faulkner. Well. She begs to be allowed to see Mr. Holmes. She absolutely implores it. I suppose I shall have to give way, Judson. Ask Miss Faulkner to come down to the drawing room. May I uh, ask Mr. Holmes what message you sent up that could have so aroused Miss Faulkner's desire to come down? Merely that if she wasn't down in five minutes, I'd go up. Oh, that was it. Quite right. And unless I'm very much mistaken, I hear the young lady on the stairs. In which case, she has one and one half minutes to spare. <laughs> Alice, that is Miss Faulkner. Let me introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Miss Faulkner. I'm most charmed to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I was more than anxious to come down, only my doctor has forbidden me seeing anyone. But then when Cousin Freddy said I might come down, well, that fixed the responsibility on him, so I have a perfectly clear conscience. I thank you very much indeed for consenting to see me, Miss Faulkner. But I regret you were put to the trouble of having to make such a very rapid change of dress. <coughs> Yes, I did hurry a trifle, I must confess. I'm so sorry. Oh, Mr. Holmes is quite living up to his reputation, isn't he, Freddy? Hardly. He's been telling me the most astonishing things. Oh, dear, they weren't true. 
What did he say? He wanted to know what it was about the safe in the lower part of that desk that caused me such horrible anxiety. <laughs> but there isn't anything, is there? Well, that's just it. There's a safe there, but there's nothing in it. <laughs> perhaps you'll do better next time, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> yes, Mr. Holmes, perhaps next time you better try on me. Yes, Mr. Holmes, what do you think of her? Oh, it is very easy to discern one thing about Miss Faulkner. And that is that she is particularly fond of the piano. That her touch is exquisite, her expression quite wonderful, and her technique extraordinary. While she likes light music very well, she is extremely fond of Chopin, Liszt, and Schubert. She plays a great deal. Indeed, I see it as her chief diversion, which makes it all the more remarkable that she has not touched the piano for three days. <coughs> oh, dear, it's quite surprising, isn't it? Certainly better than he did for me. I'm glad somewhat to repair my shattered reputation. <laughs> and as a reward, will Miss Faulkner be so good as to play me something of which I am particularly fond? I shall be delighted if I can. If you can. Something tells me Chopin's prelude number 15 is at your fingers in. Oh, yes, I can give you that. It will please me so much. I don't know if I can play in front of such a critical listener as Mr. Holmes. Any error may be charged to me, Miss Faulkner. Tell me, Mr. Holmes, how did you know so much about my playing, my expression, my technique? Your hands. Oh. And my preference for the composers you mentioned. Your music rack. How simple. But you said I hadn't touched the piano for three days. How did... The keys. Keys? We had a black fog three days ago. <laughs> oh, dear, I never knew Teresa to forget before. Oh. You must think us very untidy, I'm sure. Oh, quite the reverse, Miss Faulkner. I see from many things that you are not untidy in the least. And I'm therefore compelled to conclude that the failure of Therese is due to something else. What? To some unusual excitement or disturbance that has recently taken place in this house. You're doing very well, Mr. Holmes. You deserve your Chopin. How kind you are. <laughs>